Are you a good person? Most people say they are. Well, if everybody's so good, why is there so much crummy stuff happening in the world? My name is Rabbi Yitzwine, and I want to welcome you to Life is Great, where every week we take another universal value that is derived from Judaism, and we explore it on its own merits. We'll figure out what good is and how we can make the world a better place. Stay with us. Welcome back and good morning. Today we're talking about goodness and how to be a good person. You know, everybody thinks that they are a good person. Everybody wants to be good. They want to be good so badly, they're willing to die to be good. What do I mean? You'd be hard pressed to find anyone who would kill 100 innocent children in order to save their own skin. You might even be hard pressed to find a person who would be willing to kill one innocent person in order to save their own skin. We, that means that we would literally die to be good. It's such an important part of who we are, self-esteem, integrity. I'm a good man. Everyone wants to be a good man. Everyone says they're a good man. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you'll notice something that many people that are, well, almost evil, will insist they are good, much more so than someone who is a good person. A good person says, oh, I don't know if I'm really that good. I try to be good. An evil man, he says, I'm good. You know, but goodness is very, very difficult. It's much more difficult and much more complex than we think it is. Imagine you're sitting on a park bench, right? And you sit down, you're going for a little run one morning, sit down Sunday morning, sit down. Ha, ha, ha. You look down, you see a manila envelope. You pick it up. You, oh, as you pick it up, you're about to open it to see what's in there. A guy comes running up to you and says, oh, excuse me, sir. I, I just forgot that manila envelope. I'm so sorry, you know. And he said, oh, sure, here it is. You hand it to him. He said, thank you so much. In that envelope is $20,000. My life savings, without it, I wouldn't have had anything. Okay, how do you feel? Feel pretty good, very nice. Well, scenario number two. Going for a jog, Sunday morning, sit down at the park bench. <sighs> you look down, you see him in a little envelope. You open it up. You say, oh my gosh, there's $20,000 in here. You're sitting there, no one's around. So you sit now, you say, well, maybe I'll wait for a while, see if someone comes to claim it. Five minutes goes by, 10 minutes goes by, half hour, nobody's walking by. An hour goes by, you're sitting there, nobody's walking by, you say, you know, I'm gonna give it five more minutes. You look at your clock, your watch is like going there, it's you know, almost up there, and it's now an hour and five minutes. You've spent the money in your mind, right? You've already given out the money, right? You stand up, you're about to walk away, a guy comes running up to you and say, huh, huh, huh. have you seen him in a little envelope? It's about this big by this big. I think I left it right here underneath this bench. You pull the envelope out, and you say, is this what you're looking for? And you hand it to him. He says, oh, thank you so much. $20,000, my life savings. Now how do you feel? Okay. <laughs> some of you feel good, some of you feel a little, ah, not so good. Which person's a better man? Second guy's a better man. The second guy's a better man because it was harder for him to give over the envelope. First guy, he didn't even know what was in the envelope. He just picked up something from the floor and passed it to someone. Second guy, oh, he already spent the money. It was a little more difficult. He's a better man. See, being good is not always so easy. There's conflict in regards with being good. So this is what I did. I went out to my favorite coffee bean and I asked some of you if you thought you were good. And I wanted to know if you felt there was an impediment to you being good, why you felt you were good. Let's hear what some of you had to say. Ruby, do you think you're a good person? Oh yes, I do, definitely. I am. Why? What makes you good? Um, make me good because I like to help when I can. Okay. I'm very good with the olders. I respect the olders. For me, are very, very important. Nice. If Is there anything that gets in the way of you being a better person? No, nothing. When I want, if I wanted to help, if I, I wanted to keep being a good person, no, nothing is going to stop me. Do you think, are you the absolute best person you could possibly could be? I try my best to be. Okay, Elizabeth, are you a good person? Yes. What makes you a good person? Um, I'm caring and thoughtful and a good parent and a respectful friend. Beautiful. What get, is there anything that gets in the way of you being the best person you could be? Work. 
<laughs> um, is that your boss over there? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, unfulfilling obligations. Obligations that you have to do that are not fulfilling oh. individually. I get it. Okay, okay Kevin. Yeah. Um, are you a good person? I'm a great person. I love that. <laughs> yeah. What makes you so great? Uh, just love being in the moment and love people. You love people. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. Is there anything that gets in the way of you being a great person? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I guess just like the day-to-day -day grind, getting getting lost in all of the the hustle and bustle of living, I guess, and trying to figure out ways to escape that and really remember what's important in life. Uh, welcome back. So as you can see, everyone we spoke to thinks they're a good person, and different people had different reasons why they felt they were good people. But I always have to go back to the initial issue in terms of what does it mean to be good? How do you define goodness? So Jewish tradition gives us a very, very clear definition of good and a very clear definition of evil. Now in Hebrew, the word for good is tov, and evil, the word is ra. Okay, ra. So now goodness is defined as one's ability to do the will of the Almighty. In other words, goodness means doing what God wants me to do. Ra, evil, is going against that which God wants me to do. And when we put it in the, that perspective, the idea of being a good moral person takes an entirely new meaning because goodness does not just mean A, not hurting someone else. Goodness does not mean just once in a while helping. Goodness is based on my ability to actually stop and say, what does God want me to do in this particular situation? So if you think about it, God has an opinion about everything we do in every situation. And my question is, what does God want me to do right now? How would I ever know that? <laughs> you know, you think about it. How do you know what God wants you to do? I don't always know what God wants me to do. I mean, the first step is, should be clear. You know, we have commandments, we have a Torah, five books of Moses, the Talmud, Jewish tradition, and it tells us basically 613 commandments, basic guidelines in terms of what we should do and what we should not do. It doesn't cover every situation, but intuitively, I should be able to match my intuition with my knowledge of Torah and together, I will be able to figure out what the right thing to do is. You know, our tradition tells us a great story. It says that when you were in your mother's womb, an angel came to you and taught you everything you need to know about life, including, you know, what you need to do to make a living, get married, raise children, even when you die. Right before you were born, it touched you right underneath you right here, gave you a little mark under your nose, and boom, you forgot it all. It's a beautiful piece of Talmud because it's, it's sending a message that really intuitively you know what you should do. But we live in a complex world, as we illustrated before. We're put in situations that are fraught with conflict. And so therefore, sometimes we have to look into the Torah and say, what does God want me to do in this particular situation? And that's my question all the time, actually. And I teach people this as well. A person should stop whatever situation they're in Say, what does Jewish law have to say about this particular situation? It could be something that happened in business. Could be something that happens at home. Could be happens, could have something to do with something that happens in my, your heart. What does Jewish law have to say? And that, in conjunction with our intuition, will basically tell us the correct path. The second aspect to learning about what does God want me to do so that I truly can be a good person is I have to surround myself with people that being good and doing good is important to them. I remember one time in our shul, Young Israel Aish, we hosted a Toastmasters group. And I was amazed to find out that the people at Toastmasters, it's a group of people, they get together and they talk about public speaking. They use Toastmasters like I use a synagogue, literally. That was their group of friends. They all spoke about improving the world, making the world a better place. That's what they did. I know several people that are in 12-step programs. And again, those meanings provide a small society that encourage others, to the participants, to do good, more good, and more often. So finding the right friends, so you hear the right stories, right role models, 
that will help us be better people. You know, my son's rabbi's grandfather was an amazing man. The famous story told about him, Rabbi Lopian. Rabbi Lopian was the head of a, a school, a yeshiva, a school for, for people that were studying Judaism. And they were boys. And in every yeshiva, they have prayer services in the morning. And in every yeshiva, there's a guy whose job is to go around, knock on the door, and wake all the boys up for prayers. It's called a vecker. So, you know, this rabbi who's in his 80s at the time and needed a cane to walk, you know, to support himself as he walked. So he had the job of being the vecker. He would walk around going in the dorms and he'd have to walk down the steps and over a rocky road and then climb up into a what we would call a construction trailer where the boys were sleeping in. And he'd take his cane and he'd knock on the door and say, good morning, everyone. Time to wake up. It's time to go to prayer service. It's a shakris to, to pray. And someone said, you know, Rabbi, why you're in your 80s. It's hard for you to go down the steps, go up the steps, the rocky road. You're getting up earlier than everyone else. Why are you the vecker? Why are you waking everyone up for prayers? And he said, you know, I'm an elderly man and I'm a big rabbi. I'm a well-known rabbi. Nobody lets me do anything for them. Nobody lets me perform any acts of kindness for them. They only want to do it for me. But in my yeshiva, in my school, I determine who gets, to, who gets the mitzvah, who gets to do the act of kindness to go around and wake up all the boys for prayers. You get it? He viewed it as an act of kindness he was doing it. And he said, I don't want to let anybody else do it. I'm a person. I'm a human being. I've got to do an act of kindness. So he would not stop and let anyone else take that away from him, even though physically it was very, very difficult for him. The next aspect in, of learning to do good is very similar to this story about, with Rabbi Lopian, is we have to develop a thirst for doing good. We have to desire to do good. We have to become, in Hebrew, we call it ohaveitz chesed, people who love doing kindness. You know, the, the example in the Torah, in the Bible, of someone who loved doing kindness was our forefather Abraham. You know, the story is told that Abraham, the third day after he, after he circumcised himself, he circumcised himself without anesthesia, right? He's in his tent and he's sad. God came to visit him and God is speaking with Abraham. And he saw that, God, that Abraham was very sad because he didn't have any guests. So what happened? God appeared three Arabs to come. Eventually we found out they were angels and they came out and Abraham saw them in the distance and said, you know, God, it's great schmoozing with you, but hold that thought. He gets up and he runs out in the desert and he takes these Arabs. And he says, please, you know, come into my tent and I'll wash your feet and I'll have a morsel of bread to eat and come on in. And the angels, the Arabs, they, they said, okay, we'll do that. And they, they came in. And then Abraham prepared a whole feast for them and fed them and took good care of them and then actually escorted them as, as they went on their way. What's so amazing about this story is that God made it a very hot day to initially to keep people away, keep the travelers away, because Abraham, he just, he circumcised himself. He's, he's recovering from surgery, a painful surgery on a sensitive part of the body. And it bothered Abraham more that he could not perform an act of kindness for others than the pain that he experienced from the surgery. Now, when I was at Coffee Bean before and I was asking this question, you know, tell me something, why are you good? I was actually a little surprised with some of the answers because over the years, I found that for most people, they just say, listen, if I don't hurt anybody, then I'm a good guy. But actually find, we find that King David wrote in Psalms, he wrote the famous verse, Sur Mirava Asetov, remove yourself from evil and do good that it's actually not good enough to just not hurt others. A person has to, as we've said, develop a passion for doing good for others. We have to examine a little better. How do you know what is good, what is bad? And what happens when the two seem a little mixed? I had a, to illustrate this point, I have a very interesting question that I went back out to Coffee Bean and I asked, some of our participants in the show. Let's hear what they said to my very interesting question. Sharon, if I were to give you $10 to go to that person over there and 
no consequences, and all you have to do is spit in their face. Would you do it? No. <laughs> no. What if I gave you $1,000? I still don't think I could do it. That's assault. <laughs> <laughs> what if I gave you... What if I, I upped the fancy? I gave you a million dollars. Would you do it? A million dollars? All you got to do is go spit in their face. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> a million dollars might be tempting, but spitting in somebody's face? Yeah. I don't know about that. Ten million dollars? Ten million dollars. Ten? <laughs> it's just up in the price. <laughs> yeah. Would you still spit in their face? Would you still not? Or still not. Oh my God. It would have to be with a gazillion apologies if I did it. <laughs> a million dollars could set you up for life, you know? <laughs> Is it worth it? Is it worth it to embarrass someone, humiliate someone, if you're set up for life? Oh my God. I don't know. That's that's a hard question to answer. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Just go over there and spin their face. Would you do it? No. Okay. What about a thousand dollars? Possibly. What about? A hundred thousand dollars, would you do it? Absolutely. Okay, great. What happened between the ten dollars and the hundred thousand um, dollars? The You simply realized that uh, if you had that much money, you could do a lot of things that you might want to do, and the relative unimportance of spinning in somebody's face kind of pales in comparison to all the things that a hundred thousand dollars can let you do. Great. Was Robin Hood a good guy? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Hey guys, if I'd give you $10 to go over to that person over there, no consequences, and you, all you gotta do is spit in their face, would you take it? No. No? Okay. $10? No, I'm not that broke. <laughs> what, <laughs> what about a thousand bucks? Still not that broke. <laughs> yeah, not, not a thousand bucks. No. What about a hundred thousand dollars? Uh, sure, probably. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. you guys go for a hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah split so. it with them. And definitely a million and yeah. afterwards. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you can't make any deals beforehand. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. What What happened uh, before it, when it was ten dollars and a hundred thousand dollars? What changed? The reward. Yeah. The reward. <laughs> <laughs> the reward. Right. Yeah. Still wrong, but the reward was bigger. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, was Robin Hood a good guy? Mm, I, sure. I don't know. Not Still, having lived back then, all you <laughs> get is revisionist history, so maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Okay, but the idea, I'll do something wrong, but you know what? I'll make it worth their while. All right, got a lot of smiles from that particular question, but I want to ask you, what would you do? What would you do if I asked you, hey, listen, I'll give you $10, go over to that guy over there, just spit in his face. No consequences. Would you do it for $10? Maybe would you do it for $1,000? No, you're not gonna do it for $1,000. Would you do it for $10,000? Probably not. Would you do it for a million? Uh, a million, you're probably gonna do it. Why, now, what happened? Why would a person, why would a person spit in someone's face for a million dollars, but they won't spit in their face for $10? So one of our guys said, Kevin said it was because of the reward. The reward got bigger. Well, let me tell you how I phrase it. Because you know you've done worse for less. You get it? Most people have done a lot worse. You know, for $10, no, that's horrible. That's disgusting. Spit in someone's face. That person was made in God's image, right? Another person made in the Almighty's image. I'm not going to spit in their face. For $1,000, no, oh, still made in God's image. A million dollars, well, you know what? I've done worse for less. Listen, I'm going to hell anyway. I may as well enjoy life while I can, right? <laughs> okay. And then you find that many people came up with this idea. You know what I'll do is I'll, I'll give some of the money to the person. That's why, I, that's why I asked, is Robin Hood a good guy? Is Robin Hood, does it work? Does it work? Are you allowed to steal from the rich to give to the poor? Are you allowed to do a sin in order that you can do a mitzvah so that you can do something good. Does that make sense to anybody? Think about it for a second. Does it make sense to anybody here? Let me go do a horrible sin, because now I do a horrible sin, now I got the resources, I can go and do a lot of good stuff. If that was true, then we should all go rob a bank, take the money, and then give it to charity. Can't do it. See, in Jewish law, it's called a mitzvah, habat mina vera, a no mitzvah, a commandment, that is achieved by doing a sin is not a mitzvah. It's not a commandment. You haven't done anything good. 
And that's what many people eventually they get to, and that's the confusion. It's a confusion to think that such a thing would be appropriate. Because we have to know that when God evaluates our lives, he takes all the bad things we do, and they're over here, and we've got to deal with them individually. And then he takes all the good things we do, puts them over here, and we have to deal with those things individually as well. It's not a function of saying, listen, I'll do a little bit of good, and now I've done some good. I, you know, God will cut me some slack, I'll do some bad, and then, okay, now I did some bad, so you know, I gotta work out some good over here. It doesn't work that way. And so part of the confusion of whether or not I'm being good or not is, is wrapped up in my desire to kind of just take the easy way out. And it's not just like, oh, he's a lazy bum. It's no, that's who we are. If we recognize that this is part of our nature and it is one of the fundamental tests of humanity, then we will grab that test, embrace the test, and recognize it when the confusion is seeping in. My name is Rabbi Yitzwein. You're watching Life is Great. And I encourage you, don't go away. We're going to be back with the Rabbi's Inbox segment where you will have an opportunity to send me a message. I promise you I'll give you a great answer. And we will continue with more inspiration in just a moment. Welcome back to the Rabbi's Inbox. Great to have you today. This is your opportunity to send me any question you'd like, and I promise I will send you a response back. I might even read one of these questions on the air. Let's go straight to it. It says, Dear Rabbi, I have always tried to live my life by the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them others do unto you. However, people don't seem to do that with me. <laughs> I do believe in karma, but it doesn't seem to work. What am I missing? You know, it's such a great, it's a real question. So first of all, I got to tell you something. You are responsible for your actions. They are responsible for their actions. I always tell my children, you know, and this is always a good way to balance yourself. Ask yourself, how would you direct your children to behave? And many times that will tell you how you should behave. And I tell them, listen, you be a good person. You do the right thing. Always do the right thing. And what other people do, that's up to them. God looks at you. God looks at them. That's the first point. The next point is karma, what goes around comes around. We call it in Hebrew, mida keneged mida, measure for measure. It does work. It's a spiritual law. The Almighty does give to us that which we send out to the world. However, we have to keep in mind God pays us in a different currency and on His timeline than we might expect. So therefore, just because you're charitable does not necessarily mean that other people will be charitable in the same way to you. Nor does it mean that just because you help someone today or refrain from speaking badly about someone right now, that immediately someone will refrain from speaking badly about you or will help you. It might come back to you in a year. The payment might come not in what you did for another person. It might come in terms of someone being kind to your children. So keeping that in mind, that we only win by doing the right thing, you can never lose by doing the right, th the right thing, and that God does pay, but he might pay at a different time, he might pay in a different currency, then your question, I think, a person really has to address. The golden rule, do unto others as others would have do unto you. I remember that President Bush, right after President Obama came into office, and started instituting new policies. They asked him, they said, President Bush, what do you think of the new president's policies? And he responded with a good answer, I thought. He said, I have no comment on anything the president is doing. I wish to treat others the way I would hope that they would treat me. What was interesting is that President Bush had already concluded his presidency. That was interesting to me on that, on that point. But that is a generally a good way to live your life. Treat others the way you want others to treat you. However, it is not the Jewish golden rule. That's the non-Jewish golden rule. The Jewish golden rule is stated as Hillel mentioned in the Talmud, which is that which is detestable in your eyes, don't do to others. You get it? It's the opposite. It's in the negative. See. Do unto others as you hope others would do unto you. Well, you know, I want others to give me money. Does that mean I should go around giving others money? Maybe, but I want them to give me more than I give them because I, I want to come out ahead, right? So no, 
Hillel's statement, in my eyes, makes a lot more sense. That which is detestable, in your eyes, don't do to others. In other words, a certain part, and problem, it might be the first part about being a good person, is stay out of people's way. Don't be offensive. Wear deodorant. Brush your teeth. Don't have body odor. Don't have bad breath. Put a, and you know what? After, you, after you're not offending anybody, then work on making other people's lives better. I think that that's a proper way to go. And so therefore, I would encourage you, keep the golden rule, but make sure you add in the negative as well. And if you add in the negative, then you'll make sure that in addition to helping this person, visiting the sick, being charitable, you'll also keep your eyes open a little better to make sure that you're not offending anyone, most likely unintentionally offending someone, because you will keep your eyes open and make sure that you just don't want to do anything that is detestable in your eyes. My name is Rabbi Yitzwine. I want to thank you so much for being part of Life is Great. If you're ever in Las Vegas, I want to encourage you to come on by our shul, Young Israel Asia of Las Vegas. We're located at 9590 West Sahara, right near Sahara and Fort, Apac uh, Sahara and Fort Apache. And I promise you, we will make you feel very, very welcome as you come and just check out our synagogue and enjoy the pleasure of Torah and the blessings that God wishes to shower upon all of you. Do you know someone who needs a little more happiness in their life? Maybe it's you who needs more happiness in your life. Yes, you've seen the Life is Great TV show. You perhaps have heard the Rabbi show. But now it's time to get Life is Great, revealing the seven secrets to a more joyful you. This book was something tangible that you can give your friends and family, where they can keep by their bedside, take it on vacation, leaf through it, page at a time or chunk of pages at a time, and each time they will learn another secret, another tool that they can use in order to get the absolute most out of life. What better present can you give your friends and family than the wisdom to live a better life? Want more wine? Turn your radio to AM 720 KDWN or go online to therabbishow.com to hear The Rabbi Show starting right after the news at 9 a.m. Hey, how you doing? Reading this book, you would think there's nothing better. But I gotta tell you, there is. I invite you to come join us in the community at Young Israel Aish and experience Shabbat the hospitality, the warmth, and the smiles all around that you will receive. Come on, join us, Young Israel Aish. I want to thank all of you, and I want you to know that the only way we can continue to distribute and to do these programs are through your generous contributions to therabbishow.com. So I'd like to encourage you today to go to therabbishow.com and make some kind of donation. Everything is appreciated in order to help us continue to spread these positive values and enrich and enhance other people's lives. Thank you.